to sit back in your seats and get comfortable, say hello to your neighbor, and get ready for this robust sensory experience. When we explore food at Rethinking Soup, we look at an issue or an innovation or a piece of legislation in an expansive way. We single out mushrooms, Victory Gardens last month, or food trucks last year, and then design a conversation around these very discrete items. But when we select these topics, we choose them because they tell us something about our food ways and our food systems that challenge us or elevate us or inspire us. This is the case today with Ms. Edna Lewis, whose life and work we will meditate on for the next 40 minutes or so. Ms. Lewis, as I've learned as she was called throughout her long career, gives us a glimpse into African-American farm life in the early 20th century, the New York art and bohemian scene that surrounded her restaurant, Cafe Nicholas in the East Manhattan area in the 1940s and 50s, as well as politics and social issues throughout the 20th century. Jessica Harris, culinary historian, author of 11 cookbooks documenting the food and food ways of the African diaspora, writes in her book High on the Hog in 2011 that black cuisine, and I would argue often southern cuisine, is still too often viewed as unhealthy, inelegant, and hopelessly out of sync with the culinary canons that define healthy eating today. But as we sift through Miss Lewis's recipes and stories, we will get a sense of how she inspired a generation of young chefs and redefined traditional Southern foods and preparations as classics, casting off the contempt <coughs> that country cooking often engenders. John T. Edge, the author and director of the Southern Food Foodways Alliance, said that because of her devotion to, the, to educating a nation about the nuances of Southern cooking, there was no question that the group's first Lifetime Achievement Award in 1999 would go to Miss Lewis. In the mid-90s, Miss Lewis retired from her final restaurant, Gage and Tallner in Brooklyn. She then, along with friends, founded the Society for the Revival and Preservation of Southern Food dedicated in part to seeing that people did not forget how to cook with lard. Over <laughs> our very own Southern chefs, Tara and Jessica Lane, who have a flair of Southern flavors and ingredients in all that they cook, have prepared an original Lewis Black Eyed Pea Soup recipe for you today. Today's program draws on the talents of chef Coco Scott Winbush, who conceived of the day's events and worked on the selected passages as well as incorporating and inviting the talented Samuel Williams to accompany us with his violin. This room is routinely filled with talented thinkers and cultural workers, and I'm honored to introduce you to the four women, we have a, a packed powerhouse of women on the lineup today, who will be breathing life into Miss Lewis's words. Our first presenter, our first reader, is Michaela Rivers. She's a master's student in the Museum Studies program at UIC. She's been a museum educator for five years here at the Hull House. She's the recipient of the Puma Scholarship for Outreach and Diversity from Second City. And she actually just told me that she sings at the House of Blues at the Gospel Brunch. So you can check Woo! that out. I did not know that. Um, our second reader is Penelope Bingham. She's a re repeat presenter, friend, and um, family in the Rethinking Soup community. Penelope is an Illinois Humanities Council Rhodes Scholar who lectures across the state about American cookbooks and culture. And Penelope 
will be our second reader. Our third reader will be Alice Kim. She's an activist, a cultural organizer, a worker and writer, and director of the Public Square. Alice will be reading the fall section. And our final reader is Dr. Lori Baptista. She will be reading the Winter and Christmas Selection. And Dr. Baptista is the director of the African American Cultural Center on Campus. She's earned her PhD in Performance Studies from Northwestern University. She's an interdisciplinary scholar and artist whose work focuses on how diaspora communities maintain important social relationships through cultural traditions, most notably food. Her most recent research is an ethnographic study of Chicago's Roseland community. So I am going to say a few words about Chef Coco, and then I'm going to turn the program over to her. Chef Coco leads with love when it comes to food. She is a graduate of the Culinary Institute, trained in classical cooking. She's a staple in the cooking community and education events in Chicago. As you will see from today's program, she has a generous and adventurous spirit when it comes to food and community. So I'm going to turn it over to her. Thank you much. It's great being here today. Um, when I was asked, well, I wasn't asked. I asked to be here. Um, I come often. I like the topics. I like being part of it. But Black History Month, I decided we needed to do something that, you know, was about black history. And Chef Edna was one of my mentors. She's one of the ones that made me want to go to school and become a chef. She and Verna Mae Grosvenor, um, both. I would consider intuitive cooks, but Chef Etna was able to take hers to another level and be acknowledged as a chef. Um, most African American females who cook, until recently, never reached the status of being called chef. Chef Etna Lewis, I think, was the first. Um, some of the things I have accomplished, uh, a couple of years ago, I had a live cooking segment on WGN Morning News. Came on every Tuesday between 8.30 and 8.45. And it was great, lasted for about three years. One of my dreams and my goals when I graduated chef school is that I didn't see African American female chefs on TV. Most of the black women were relegated to the status of cooks. Um, great cooks, nonetheless, regional cooks, but cooks. Once I got my chef certificate, I made that my goal, to get on TV as an African-American chef. I achieved my goal. And not only achieving it, I was the first one to have a live segment, weekly segment, that went around the world. Now, I had no idea, but at that point in time, and still is, WGN is a superstation. I thought I was just coming on here in Chicago. <laughs> and then my family and friends from around the city, uh, around the, the country, would start calling me, girl, I saw you on TV, ah. I was like, oh yeah? And then I realized I was around the world when one day my husband and I were up by Wrigley Field. And we'd gone to a restaurant walking down the street. And these um, Latino men ran up on me. Chicago, 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 Chicago. Okay, and then it was, Chef Coco, Sammy Sosa! Chef Coco, Sammy Sosa! <laughs> well, how me and Sammy get together? And so, <laughs> I, you know, with my broken Spanish and then broken English, surmised that Sammy Sosa and I were their icons here in Chicago because they would watch us on satellite TV in the Dominican Republic. So that's when I realized I was around the world. So not only did I accomplish my goal, I accomplished a big goal. I wanted to do this once again to give homage to my legacy, um, one of cooking and women who look like me who cook. Mm -hmm. And once again in the realm of chef. Chef, chef Carla Hall, you're gonna have to thank me one day. <laughs> Just to say, to keep the legacy going. I'm gonna start this off with the introduction in Chef Edna's book. We took all the writings from her book called Taste of Country Cooking. A copy is floating around, as is a copy of her other book, um, Pursuit of Flavor. And this will set the stage so that you have more of an understanding of what was really going on with our other readers. Um, all of this is Chef Edna's voice. So all I ask is that you pay attention, listen, and more importantly, relax, because we've got some of the best stuff going. Wonderful dramatic readings, 
great soup by Chef Tara and wonderful violin mm -hmm. music by Samuel Savoir Fair. This is what coming together as a diverse community means. You cannot eat with someone and not like them. You can't listen to music with them and not like them. And we have to figure out a whole lot more ways to stop them, to make sure we like each other. Because we got a whole lot of not liking going on in our country right now. I will now start the piece. This is the introduction to her book. I grew up in Freetown, Virginia, a community of farming people. It wasn't really a town. The name was adopted because the first residents had all been freed from chattel slavery, and they wanted to be known as a town of free people. My grandfather had been one of the first. His family, along with two others, were granted land by a plantation owner, Claiborne R. Mason, Jr., for whom one of them had served as coachman. The property was situated just behind Lahore, a village consisting of only one post office and a general store, built around 1840. It still stands there today, looking very much the same as it did then. After the first three families were settled, eight more joined in and purchased their land. They built their homes in a circle around my grandfather's, which was in the center, the heartbeat. My grandmother had been a brick mason as a slave, purchased for the sum of $950 by a rich landowner who had several tracts of land and wanted to build two imposing houses on different locations. Grandmother was put to work molding bricks and then carrying them and laying them. One of the houses she worked on today still stands, owned and restored by a college professor, but the other was destroyed in the Civil War. It was a job that caused my grandmother great anguish because she would have to go off all day to work on the big house, leaving her babies in their cribs, and not returning until late in the evening to feed and care for them. That fact, years later, after her children were grown up and were living in free time, she would still take her kerosene lamp and go upstairs to make sure they were there. And all right is a measure of the pain she bore. It is no wonder that they decided to build a big house so that they could all be together the first part was made of logs, then they added four rooms and clapboard the whole building. The kitchen was separated from the main house, as were all the kitchens in Freetown then. The first school in the area was held in my grandfather's living room, chosen no doubt because he was one of the oldest in the community and had a large and lively family. Children came from as much as six to eight miles to learn. And the teacher was from Ohio, a graduate of Oberlin College. Soon Freetown became a lively place with poetry readings, singing quartets, productions of plays put on by young people. One of the biggest achievements was when my youngest aunt went away to a boarding school in Manassas, Virginia. Her brothers had worked and raised the money to send her. Later, my sisters and brothers and I attended the first accredited school in the area, which was built with funds raised by the same teacher. And then, well along in her years, who had taught in grandfather's living room. And it was the early free, freed men who built the church and the entertainment hall and organized events like Revival Week, Emancipation Day, and the various other feasts that punctuated our farm here. The spirit of pride in community and of cooperation in the work of farming is what made Freetown a very wonderful place to grow up. Ours was a large family. My parents, my grandfather, three sisters, two brothers, and cousins who stayed with us from time to time, all living under the same roof. The farm was demanding, 
but everyone shared in the work. Tending the animals, gardening, harvesting, preserving the harvest, and every day preparing delicious foods that seem to celebrate the good things of each and every season. As well, there was the bounty yielded up by the woods, the fields, and the streams. It was always fun to go searching for nuts and berries, to have the men bring in some game in the fall, or the first fresh fish of spring, all of which added not only to our regular supply of food, but always seemed to bring something festive to our table. Whenever there were major tasks on the farm, work that had to be accomplished quickly, and timing is important in farming, then everyone pitched in, not just family, but neighbors as well. And afterwards, we would all take part in the celebrations, sharing the rewards that follow hard labor. The years seem to be broken up by such great events as hog butchering, Christmas, the cutting of ice in winter, springtime with its gathering of the first green vegetables, and the stock going away to summer pasture, the dramatic moment of wheat threshing, the excitement of revival week, race day, and the observance of emancipation day. All these events were shared by the whole community, young and old alike. I guess that is why I've always felt that the people of Freetown were very special. They showed us love and affection for us as children. At the same time, asking something of each of us. And they knew how to help each other so that the land would thrive for all. Each family had its own different talents, its special humor, but they were bound together in an important way. Over the years since I left home and lived in different cities, I have kept thinking about the people I grew up with and about our way of life. Whenever I go back to visit my sisters and brothers, we relive old times, remembering the past. And when we share again in gathering, wild strawberries, candy, rendering lard, finding walnuts, picking persimmons, making fruitcake. I realized how much the bond that held us together had to do with food. Since we are the last of the original families with no children to remember and carry on, I decided that I wanted to write down just exactly how we did things when I was growing up in Freetown that seemed to make my life so rewarding. Although the founders of Freetown have passed away, I am convinced that their ideas do live on for us to learn from, to enlarge upon and pass on to the following generations. I am happy to see how many young people are going back to the land and to the south. They are interested in natural farming, and they seem to want to know how we did things in the past to learn firsthand from those who worked hard, loved the land, and relished the fruits of their labor. I hope this book will be helpful to them, but above all, I want to share with everyone who may read this a time and place that is also very dear to my heart. had a particular interesting feature, but spring held something special. After the long spell of winter, we welcomed the first warm day of February, heralding the coming of spring. Often a mother hen would surprise us with a healthy brood of baby chickens that she hatched in the hayloft and somehow gotten down to the ground. They would be chirping and pecking in the snowy slush of the barnyard. We would pick them up and carry them and the mother into the kitchen and place them in a wooden box behind the cook stove, which served as a nursery for the early hatched chickens, baby cats, pigs, lambs, and, um, sorry, that were too weak and unaggressive to compete for food. All such animals would be kept in the kitchen until the severe cold was over, 
and they were strong enough to feed themselves. The quiet routine of the kitchen would give way to sounds of chirping and peep, 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 bah. <laughs> we were so excited about our kitchen guests that we would keep watch over them, especially the most unusual ones for ourselves. And we would keep watch over our pick, sometimes for an entire year, or until it was sold, which would be a very sad day for us. But there was always a good reason given as to why it had to be so. All the realities of life were explained to us as we grew up. Further evidence of spring would be the arrival of the noisy killdeer running around on the ground as if it were on roller skates, signaling to us that it was time to begin plowing. It continued to call out, Kadee, Kadee, during the plowing season. I will never forget spring mornings in Virginia. A warm morning and a red sun rising behind a thick fog gave the image of a pale pink veil supported by a gentle breeze that blew our thin Marquisette's curtains into the room, leaving them to fall lazily back. Being awakened by this irresistible atmosphere, we would hop out of bed, clothes in hand, rush downstairs, dress in a sunny spot, and rush out to the barn to find a sweet-faced calf, baby pigs, and perhaps a colt. We always stop by the hen house to look at the setting hens, sitting in their row of nests along the wall. They had to be checked often to see if the eggs were moist enough to hatch. I can still remember the moist smell of chickens hatching and making quiet, cuddly noises. The mother hen would fuss and ruffle her feathers, very annoyed at my mother for lifting her from the nest to sprinkle the eggs. There would be guineas sitting under the wood pile where no one could reach them. And they would appear one day in a brood that was so swift of movement that one could only get a glimpse of them scampering through the weeds. This was truly a time of birth and rebirth in the vineyard. Field and forest. Early morning visits to the vineyard extended to the woods as well, which was just across the stream from the barn. The quiet beauty and rebirth there was so enchanting. It caused us to stand still in silence and absorb all we had heard and saw. The palest liverwort, the elegant pink lady slipper displayed against the velvety green path of moss, leading endlessly through the woods. Birds flitting back and forth as if it was a new day, a spider winding his catch with a beautiful dew laden web shimmering and glistening in the early morning sunshine, the early morning sound of a mournful dove, the caw, caw of the blackest crow looking for food, a stream filled, with the melted snow of winter and it would flow quietly by us, gurgling softly and gently pulling the leaf of a fern that hung lazily from the side of its bank. After moments of completing exhilaration, we would joyfully return to the house for breakfast. Floating out to greet us was this aroma of coffee cooking and meat frying, mingled with the smell of oak wood burning on the cook stove. Mm. We would wash our hands and take our places to the bench behind the table for children. Steamed whole hominy. Corn was the black backbone of the diet of Freetown for both the people and their stock. Of the variety of ways it was used, transforming dried corn into hominy seemed the most miraculous process. My Aunt Janine Hillsack was an expert at making hominy. One morning, I was visiting her, noticing again the big iron pot in the back of her cook stove. I asked her to explain to me how she did it. First, she told me hardwood ashes, about two gallons, were boiled for 10 minutes in four gallons of cold water. The water was then drained away and put aside. The ashes were discarded, and then the water was returned to the pot. Three quarts of shelled, whole grain, white corn were put into a solution over a medium high and cooked for 25 to 30 minutes, then left to steep for an hour about after the cooking had stopped. 
The corn was then removed from the lye solution and put into a large pan of clean water. At that point, she would rub the grains together in her hands and the whole husk would slip off. The grains would be rinsed a number of times until the water became crystal clear and all the specks were removed. Now she set the grains to cook gently under until tender, about an hour, stirring constantly and skimmering to keep them from burning at the bottom. By this time they would have swelled and doubled in size and be glistening white. The hominy was uh, to steam over slimmering water until ready to serve for about 10 to 15 minutes. The hominy had a delicious flavor. It was always served at breakfast and with a gravy or a natural sauce from the cooked meats. It would be spooned over with a lot of sauce. Without sauce, it was very tasty too. Hominy is still being made in that way in homes in the South, but you can buy it fully cooked or canned in many city supermarkets. Corn pone. Corn pone was a delicious equivalent to the ash cake and is legendary in our history. A beautiful poem written by one of our early greats, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, entitled, The Mammy Says the Lessing of the Corn Pointer's Hot. When there was a need for a quick hot snack, we would light the cook stove and stir up some cornmeal and make a number of corn pones, sometimes adding crackling to make it more interesting. But they are just as delicious plain. The rather stiff batter would be shaped in both hands, Fingers closed to make a large egg shape, the shape of our hands. The pones are about three inches wide and were placed in an inch apart in a baking sheet, baked in a fairly hot oven, and when done, they were golden brown in color and very crusty outside, which made them more delicious. We would cut them in half and butter them. Green peas and cream. Green peas, or English peas as they were called, were cooked upon it was high flavored, favored, um, and considered a very great delicacy among the people of Freetown. Once the peas began to ripen, they lasted only about two weeks, so it was great excitement when we discovered that they were ripe enough to pick. Of our peas ripens first, they were shared and with the neighbors and vice versa. Peas were very flavorful and tender, maturing early in age. When milk and cream were plentiful, they were served with lots of butter and sweet cream. Bread pudding. Bread pudding and other custard dishes were popular in the early spring because of new caps and green grass producing extra pails of milk. And a good way to use up some of the stale bread was to make bread pudding. I can still remember entering the kitchen when, which was detached from the main house, and there cooling on the table near the door, would be a big pan of scrumptious looking bread pudding. Fill the air with rich smell of butter and nutmeg, rising with the layers of bread that were submerged in a custard of rich milk, fresh country eggs, and plump raisins, which served a bowl of custard would be passed as a spoon over if needed. Of course, you can make bread pudding using one layer of bread and leaving lots of custard beneath to spoon over. The times have changed today. Bread pudding is not the same quality as home baked. To make a flavor some bread pudding, the bread should be buttered liberally on the bottom side. The best bread for this is a good French or Italian style rendition. It also has to have a good shape, giving the pudding a nice looking topping when baked. Lots of grated nutmeg is what really makes a bread pudding. Grate it liberally. Harvesting and canning brought many delights at mealtime. Deep dish blackberry pie, roly poly, summer apple dumplings, peach cobblers, and always pound cake to accompany the fruits or berries that would be left over from canning. There would also be unexpected meat dishes whenever the hay moor clipped the legs of rabbits and quail that were feeding or living in the hay field. Whenever these creatures heard the mower coming, they would crouch down, making themselves perfect targets with the mower blades. 
Once they were damaged, they would have to be killed and dressed, then left to age a day or two. Then there would be a surprise dinner of fried or smothered rabbit with the quail added. And when we found the eggs, we'd set them under a bantam or give them to someone who had a hen. After they hatched, the quail chicks would stay with the domestic hen until they were big enough to return to the wild. Another surprise would be turtle soup. After a thunderstorm that brought heavy rain, the streams would be washed out and the turtles left in the field. We would always run outside after a storm to see what had happened, and often we would discover a turtle making its way to the house. And we knew immediately that the turtle would end up in a pot of soup. The main crop of garden vegetables would be coming in at this time. New cabbage, potatoes, simlin, a white squash flat and round with scalloped edges or what we know as patty pan, butter beans, string beans, tomatoes, eggplant, and roasting ears. Actually, we knew of only one kind of corn, field, and that was the corn used for the stock and for our table. We had it fried for breakfast, in pudding, stewed, and later in the season, roasted in the oven. It would be slightly brown, crispy, chewy, and delicious. The first hams of the season would be cooked about July and August, in case of an unexpected summer guest dropped in. Ham held the same rating as the basic black dress. If you had a ham in the meat house, any situation could be faced. On short notice, it would be sliced and fried with special red gravy. Otherwise, it would be leisurely simmered, then defatted and browned. The smoked shoulder was indispensable as a seasoning for other meat dishes. A slice would be added to fried chicken, guinea fowl, rabbit, squirrel, or quail. It was also used in boiled pots of cabbage, beans, watercress, and green black-eyed peas. Besides these memorable summer dishes, it was always a great treat to make ice cream on a hot summer afternoon. Mother invariably made a custard-based ice cream, and sometimes she would scorch the custard, which gave the ice cream an interesting flavor that still lingers in my younger brother's memory, so he tells me. But first we had to fetch the ice from the ice house at Lahore. Ice was as novel to us as the ice cream itself. The nearest thing we had to a refrigerator was a box that we set in the spring. It had an opening at each end to let the water pass through, and there we would put our milk, butter, and other perishables. Once we got the ice, the afternoon would be taken up with chipping it and turning the freezer. It was a five-gallon freezer and required lots of turns. When the ice cream was done, the dasher would be removed, and we would lick the cream off it immediately. The cream in the freezer had to sit for a while while it congealed. Once I remember looking into the freezer can the next morning and finding that the leftover ice cream had all returned to milk. It was like the disappearance of Cinderella's new clothes. Covered fried eggs. Covered fried eggs were developed by women who loved the outdoors and were anxious to get into the field or the garden. When the meat was about ready in the oven and the coffee and the bread were all ready, a big skillet was set on the hot section of the stove, that is, the firebox. Some fat from cooking bacon was added, and when the pan began to smoke, a dozen eggs were broken one by one and carefully slipped in. A cover was placed on the top. When the rest of the food was served up, the eggs were ready and looked as if they had been poached. They were placed on a platter and decorated with a delicious crisp bacon or place surrounding the ham. Wilted lettuce with hot vinegar dressing. Wilted lettuce was served as a vegetable during the period between spring and summer, and there wasn't too much from the garden. The lettuce leaves were washed, crisp, drained dry, and put into a bowl. Then they were seared in a combination of bacon fat, vinegar, and sugar that was boiled up and poured over the lettuce, then sprinkled with finely chopped bacon. For this dish, we used Simpson or Grand Rapids lettuce, but iceberg would be good. Watermelon rind pickles. During the melon season, we enjoyed many afternoons tasting the different kinds of watermelons. Afterwards, we would carefully select the thickest rinds and prepare them for pickling. 
We also save the seeds from the sweetest melons and then put them out to dry as our seed for the next spring's planting. The varieties we always planted were Jackson, Congo, and Tom Watson. They were very large melons and also very sweet. Brandy peaches. A recipe for brandy peaches would have been better given by my Aunt Jenny Palestock, an elegant lady and a masterful cook who envied no one. Her kitchen and vegetable garden were always orderly, and her flowers were beautiful, scented geraniums, filling the air with their fragrance. Her only child, a son, grew up and left for the city. We were left to visit and enjoy her store of knowledge and experience. Being a warm, friendly person, her friends were many and her table was always set. It was usually covered with three tiers of tablecloths, the first one touching the floor. She and her husband were great farmers. Like the other people of Freetown, they raised crops, stock, and poultry. Everyone else had either a well house or a milk house. They had both. The well house was a latticework structure, whitewashed with lime. The walls inside were lined with shelves containing perishable delicacies, all being preserved by the cool air coming up from the well. It was in the well house that she kept her brandy peaches. Preparing the peaches in Aunt Jenny's day was quite a task. First of all, peaches were very deliciously sweet and covered with a kind of wool or fur. To prepare them for brandying, she would drop the peaches for a few minutes into a pot of boiling water containing a small quantity of lye. It helped to remove the fuzz from the peaches. Lye was used quite a lot in the preparation as food, as well as for making soap for household use. After a minute or two in the lye water, she would quickly dip them out and rub them mm. in a clean, coarse cloth, removing the fur and some of the skin of the peach. Then she would wash them in cold water and dry them. She placed them in a stone jar, alternating layers of brown sugar and peaches until the jar was filled. Finally, she poured old brandy over them and tied the jar over with a strong, clean cloth and left them to age until needed. I can remember her company dinners when she served the brandy peaches with thin slices of her famous yellow vanilla pound cake, something she usually kept on hand on the sideboard. Sometimes she served brandy peaches as an accompaniment to meat dishes, especially ham and game. other seasons of the year, the coming of fall was looked upon with mixed feelings. When the leaves began to fall, all the visitors were gone, and the whistle from the trains passing through Orange County gave a long, lonesome, shrill sound as it rolled through without stopping to let off any passengers. But our spirits always lifted when my father would announce at the breakfast table on a Sunday morning in late September that he was bringing the stock home that day from the community pasture where they had grazed lazily all summer. As soon as my father and my older brother came in sight of the house, we would rush out to greet them, admiring how much the calves had grown and how fat and sleek all of the animals were. After patting and stroking them, they were herded into their winter lots and left to get used to being back home. Our thoughts turned to the opening of school in mid-October and to the harvesting of vegetable root crops like sweet potatoes, peanuts, the cutting of field corn. After school started, we'd rush home changing our clothes and help gather in the potatoes and do other daily chores. Once the corn was all cut and stacked in shocks, a group of high school students who loved my mother would come on the first moonlit night and help us with the corn shuffling. They thought it great fun, boys and girls with their favorite friends. After the shucking, they'd return to the house and be given a festive meal that my mother had had in preparation all afternoon. One of fried chicken, baked ham, roasted newly dug sweet potatoes, baked tomatoes, green beans, cake, and apple pie, the apple pie being the favorite. The young people ate heartily and left late thanking my mother and promising to come back next fall. 
The next morning of the cornfield was dotted over with mounds of yellow corn, ready to be picked up and hauled to the corn crib. Before we realized it, we were deep into fall and the other activities related to it, such as race day, hunting season, and rehearsing for the annual community concert of winter. Race day. The annual horse race at Mrs. Dupont Scott's estate, Montpellier, is held traditionally, traditionally on the first Saturday in November and is open to the whole county. For 40 years, this has been the main event of the autumn season and one of the few occasions during the year when farmers, tradespeople, estate owners, and workers mingle together. Men urging and cheering on the horses, placing bets among themselves, and enjoying the occasional sips of bourbon. The women busy selling raffle tickets and home-baked foods to raise money for local charities and enjoying the chance to visit and exchange views and family news. We would start the day with a good hearty breakfast of griddle cakes, sausages, hot bread, preserves, jam, and lots of hot coffee to brace us for this brisk November weather. Race day picnic. Beautiful Montpellier nestling in the Shenandoah Valley surrounded by an oak forest was the most perfect spot to have a great fall picnic lunch. Everyone would be dressed in the latest fashions to attend the races, even the handsome guest horses wearing the colorful silks of their stables. There was always excitement in the fresh November air, and the good hot beef consomme seemed to build an appetite for all the good things to follow. There would be a gold roast of aged pheasant, a salad of lentils, fresh picked scallions from the garden, and ham biscuits. And for dessert, thin slices of white pound cake, tangy ginger cookies, a basket of delicious wine sack apples, sweet dessert grapes, and juicy kefir pears with a thermos of a good hot black coffee. Cold roast pheasant. While many city dwellers may seem to think pheasant is only served under glass, for country folk, it was a way of life. In the fall, while harvesting the corn, we would come upon a variety of game feasting on fallen grains of corn. We always carried the rifle, hoping to return to the house at night with a bag full. We usually did come home with game of some species. Pheasant is pretty special game. Whether caught in the wild or raised in captivity, the flavor remains the same when properly aged. As great as pheasant tastes, it has much less flavor than chicken if it is dressed and cooked without aging. If purchased at a game farm or shot in the wild, it is best to let the pheasant hang in a cold place in the feather or let your butcher hold it for you. He will dress it as well. Some growers try to dress off their birds at 14 weeks, but this is too young. It is simply a way of their saving feed at the expense of flavor. Buy your pheasant from reliable sources. Damson preserves. The damson tree was one of the most popular in the orchard. More fuss was made over the tree than the preserves. It was a prolific bearer of hundreds of small plums, the shape of bird's egg, colored in an intense navy blue with a purple tinge. Damson preserves are the first that I really was aware of, mostly because of the attention bestowed on the tree. They have a tangy and distinctive flavor, especially when preserved with their pits intact, and are particularly good with all kinds of meat. If you watch carefully, you'll find damson still available in the market for a short period in late September. Get them when they first appear while they are new and high in pectin count and preserve them quickly. Puree of green black-eyed peas. Black-eyed peas were popular in the late summer and fall. They were not planted in the garden, but were planted by farmers as a green mature crop. Before the sowing of wheat, when in full foliage, they were chopped into the soil. A week before, everyone was welcome to gather the green pods before the crop was chopped under. Everyone responded and we enjoyed fresh black-eyed peas for a short period. The black-eyed pea is a truly African bean, first introduced into our area by Thomas Jefferson via France. 
France was always an exponent of aquaculture and found this lejeune high in nitrogen and other soil building qualities. Christmas. Around Christmas time, the kitchens of Freetown grow fragrant with the baking of cakes, fruit puddings, cookies, and candy. Exchanging gifts was not a custom at that time, but we did look forward to hanging our stockings from the mantle and finding them filled on Christmas morning with tasty imported nuts from Lahore's, our favorite hard candies with the cinnamon flavored red eye and oranges whose special Christmas aroma reached us at the top of the stairs. And for us poor girls, there would also be little celluloid dolls with movable arms and legs that we loved. And new paper dolls with their fascinating clip-on wardrobe. But mainly getting ready for Christmas meant preparing all kinds of delicious foods that we would enjoy with our families and friends during the days between Christmas Eve and New Year's Day. There was a special excitement in the kitchens as many of the things we prepared were foods we tasted only at Christmas. This was the only time of year when we had oranges, almonds, Brazil nuts, and raisins that came in clusters. And although we were miles from the sea, at Christmas, one of the treats we always looked forward to was oysters. The oysters were delivered to Lahore's in barrels on Christmas Eve day, and late on Christmas Eve, we would climb the steps over the pasture fence and walk along the path through the woods to the store carrying our covered tin pails. Mr. Jackson, the storekeeper, would fill some of our pails with oysters. And before we left, he always filled our hands with nuts and candy. We were excited by all the preparations for Christmas, but my own favorite chores were chopping the nuts and raisins for mother and stirring the wonderful smelling dark mixtures of fruits and brandy that would go into the fruitcake and plum pudding and decorating the house with evergreens. Just before Christmas, a green lacy vine called Running Cedar appeared in the woods around Freetown, and we would gather yards and yards of it. We draped everything in the house with it, windows, doors, even the large gilded frames that held pictures of each of my aunts and uncles. We picked the prickly branches of a giant holly tree, the largest holly I've ever seen, which grew on top of a nearby hill, and we cut armloads of pine boughs and juniper. My mother always gave the fireplace and hearth a fresh whitewash on the day before Christmas and washed, starched, and ironed the white lace curtains. On Christmas Eve, my father would set up the tree in one corner of the room and we would decorate it with pink, white, and blue strings of popcorn that we had popped, dipped in colored sugar water, and carefully threaded. Small white candles nestled on tufts of cotton for the last decorations to be placed on the tree. I love the way the greens looked set off by the white hearth and walls from the stiff white curtains which they draped. In the evenings, the soft orange glow from the fire and from the candlelight and the fragrances of the cedar and Jennifer mingling with the smell of chestnuts roasting always made me wish that Christmas would last until spring, though I suspected my mother did not share my wish. The celebration of Christmas Day began before daybreak with the shooting off of Roman candles. With a great roaring noise, they exploded into balls of red fire arcing into the still dark sky. After they had all been set off, my father would light sparklers for us. We could never imagine Christmas without the Roman candles and sparklers. For us, it was the most important part of the whole day. Finally, we would go back into the warmth of the house for breakfast. There would be eggs and sausages and plates of hot biscuits with my mother's best preserves and pan-fried oysters, which would taste so sweet, crispy, and delicious. The familiar smell of hot coffee and cocoa mixed with a special aroma of bourbon, which was part of every holiday breakfast. We were allowed to smell, but never to taste the special drink of the men folk. We all dressed on our Sunday dresses for Christmas dinner. Dinner was at noon so that we could be finished in time for the men to feed the animals before dark. 
My mother would have been in the kitchen since five o'clock and half of the night as well. When the dinner was ready, we'd gather around the table and sit for hours enjoying all of the things she had prepared. Christmas week was spent visiting back and forth, as at this time of year, the men were able to take off some time. The women enjoyed tasting each other's baking, and men took pleasure in comparing the wines they had made at harvest time. Wild plum, elderberry, dandelion, and grape. And they usually managed to enjoy a taste of that bourbon as well. Every household has a sideboard or a food safe, and these would be laden throughout the weeks with all foods that had been made for the holiday. Ours would hold baked ham, smothered rabbit, a pan of mixed small birds that had been trapped in the snow, raised guinea hen, liver pudding, and sometimes a roasted wild turkey that had grown up with our own flock, but usually a fat roast hen and all the sweet and pungent pickles my mother had made from cucumbers and watermelon rinds, crab apples, and peaches. The open shelf of the sideboard would be lined with traditional holiday cakes, caramel and coconut layer cakes, pound cake, and my mother's rich, dark, flavorful fruit cake. There were plates of fudge and peanut brittle and crocs filled with crisp sugar cookies. The food safe was filled with mince pies and fruit pies made with the canned fruit of summer. Although there were no exceptions to our usual custom of sitting down together three times a day for meals, during Christmas week, we were free to return to the food safe as many times a day as we liked, and my mother would never say a word. But at the end of the holiday week, we were all given a homebrew physic, which was really vile. It was so vile, I've never quite forgotten the taste of it. On New Year's Day, when all the Christmas decorations were taken down, we felt sad and let down. To us, our house looked drab and naked. And although the visiting back and forth would continue until winter's end, Christmas was over. Late winter. The new year ushered in long and continued cold weather, the kind needed for developing thick ice on the ponds and rivers. When it reached the desired thickness, the men of Freetown would go out and help cut it into three to four foot pieces, about two to three feet thick, and then haul it in. The ice house was a deep, round cellar, about 20 to 30 feet deep, with a roof and a door lined with poles and filled with a good layer of straw and a strong ladder extending down onto it. The ice was placed in this cellar and covered with more straw. Once filled, it was left alone until needed on hot summer days. Most farmers had their own ice houses, but we got ours from the ice house at Lahore. We used it for making ice cream, lemonade, cooling the milk, and sometimes drinking water. It was a great treat to bring the ice home in a burlap bag, chipping up small pieces to eat on a hot day. After the ice house was all filled up, most activities ceased except morning and evening feeding, milking, and bringing in water and firewood. It was in between these daily chores that the people of Freetown found more time for visiting each other. There were visitors from nearby communities, especially to visit with Grandpa. A person of his age group, 80 years and older, would arrive on horseback or in a buggy, unbridled his horse, and put it in the barn with ours. Then he would visit us for a week or two or three. We liked having visitors. It, it gave the house a festive air, and neighbors would drop by to greet the guests. We children were able to be alone in the next room and relax our behavior without being noticed. A great fire would be going in the fireplace, and we would serve homemade cake and homemade wines that seemed to be made just for such occasions. There would be lively conversations with the aged men during most of the talking, and the younger adults my father's age doing most of the listening. I would be listening too, hanging between my father's knees and watching the logs burning in the fireplace and bugs desperately trying to escape from the burning logs, with only me being aware of their desperate plight. I was too young then to understand why so much time was spent in discussion. It was only afterward that I realized that they were still in awe by the experience of chattel slavery 50 years ago and having become free men. It was something that they never tired of talking about. 
It gave birth to a song that I often heard them sing. My soul looked back and wonder how I got over. Outside, the very intense discussion went on inside. Snow blanketed it here. The mood was right for a pot of stew cooking on the side of the fireplace and some ash cakes, which were made of fresh brown cornmeal salt, salt and water, just enough to make a fairly stiff dough. The cakes were then molded by hand into an eight by four inch egg shaped cone. Wrapped in cabbage leaves, or left unwrapped and put in a clean bed of ashes in the fireplace and left to cook until needed. The summer kitchen had been closed and most of the cooking was now done in the fire hearth. The main meal was served in the evening because of the short daylight hours of winter and the early feedings of the stock. This was the time to draw upon canned vegetables and fruits that had been prepared during those unbearable hot days of summer. In addition, there was sausage, liver pudding, spare ribs, wild game from the hunting parties, and wild watercress. No winter meal was complete without a fat old barrel rock hen saved for a cold day. Stewed and served piping hot with dumplings made of a rich biscuit dough. The most popular vegetable was the wild watercress that was gathered out from the lowlands just before or after a snow. This was said to be a fine source of iron, good to eat during the dark gray days of winter. We also had thick soups of homegrown dried beans, the slices of pork, and hot, crusty breads. But for dessert, there would be bread pudding, deep dish pies, and compotes of canned fruit. Aside from entertaining, there was a great interest in the new seed catalog that began to arrive after the first of the year. The highly colored pages of seed catalogs were very tempting, although for the most part we used our own seed year after year. They were not hybrid in those days. My mother would often be tempted to buy new kinds of vegetables. The seeds were easy to grow, and as soon as something was ready to pick, we had to cook it and see what the new vegetable tasted like. <clears throat> the winter vegetable would consist of some root crops that could be left in the ground all winter and gathered as needed, such as turnips, parsnips, two artichokes, and salsify with its flavor of oyster bisque. A refreshing chain from potatoes in late winter. Cabbage, canned corn, and beans. No canned fruit had the fragrance of canned pears. Canned blackberries and peaches were also favorites of ours. So was canned applesauce made into two crust pies. And a treat was a bowl of clean snow flavored with vanilla and with sweetened heavy cream folded into it, which we called snow cream. There were also the perennial dried apples for making dried apple pie and dried peaches to chew on. Winter must have seemed forever to our mother, the lover of the outdoors. By February, she would save all of the eggshells, line them up on the windowsill, place the seed of a green bean in each one, and add about a tablespoon of water. Mm -hmm. When sprouted enough, she would set them, still in the shells, into a prepared row and cover them with soil on the first warm day of spring. Winter was surely behind us by St. Patrick's Day. That was the day when we planted our white potatoes. The people of Freetown always made a lazy bed, and it's still done this way today. This is how it went. First, we would cut off enough pieces of potatoes that had a bud or eye in them until there were enough to set out on top of a 25-foot squared-off patch of unplowed, clean ground, perhaps a half bushel of eyes. The pieces would be put into a tub and sprinkled with a bit of lime to keep them from rotting on the cut surface. The eyes were set out by us because we were small and didn't have to suffer from bending over. <laughs> Then we would cover them over with about two feet of wheat straw and leave them alone to grow up through it, bloom, and let die down. When all the foliage had turned brown and was well dried, late in July, the straw was raked off. At that point, there would be what looked like a great group of hen's nests filled with large, rounded eggs. All that was left for us to do was pick up the potatoes and store them in a cool, shady place for later use. If left in the sun, they would turn green and become bitter. I forgot to mention that the pieces left over from the eyes were used for cooking, as they were our, they were our own seed and untreated. We would have potatoes in every imaginable way. 
until we couldn't stand him anymore. Mm -hmm. That's the end of our readings. I do want to thank you. I see we maintain most of our crowd than we do from the soup, so that says a lot. Um, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope we get to do it again. This is. <laughs> Heartfelt thank you to all the readers and to Samuel for um, adding to this homage. Uh, next month's soup is actually going to be on March 5th. It's not the third Tuesday of the month, and we are going to be um, inviting an author whose book just came out called Behind the Kitchen Door, which looks at the workplace conditions of people who work in restaurants and kitchens. So we're going to think about the moral implications of being out. Um, it's part of the Chancellor's Lecture Series, so um, we're really excited to have that. So just look online, it's March 5th. Um, and as always, we have the donation jar in the back, Irina in the lovely lime green <laughs> sweater standing and waving. Um, we're just so happy to have you here. Um, we look forward to next time, and um, have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.